recording. And um, then I'd just like to uh, say that this is part of uh, a recording here. Uh, this is part of uh, um, an alumni panel that's going to take place on March 28th, 2024. Uh, but we're recording this on March 5th, 2024 with Ashali Bandari and uh, graduated in 2014 uh, from geography. So uh, we're happy to have Ashali here today. And uh, I would like to just turn it over to Ashali and have her introduce herself and then tell us a little bit about current employer and occupation and what she's done since graduation. And then uh, we'll move on to a few other questions uh, for Ashali. So if you could do that, that would be that would be great. Thank you, Bill. And thanks for having me. It's really nice to be connected to Middlebury, even though I'm so far away. So I really appreciate this. Um, so to start things off, I'm Ashali. Um, Bill said I graduated in 2014. I'm a geography major. Um, currently, I actually have two roles. I'm the director of India's first urban living lab at its social science research collective called Transitions Research. Um, our work is focused on co-creating equitable climate solutions and testing them in communities and neighborhoods in small Indian cities. And small Indian cities are like large American cities, but small Indian cities. Um, I also work part-time on a project or need basis as a senior urban planner at the Center for Social and Behavior Change at Ashoka University, which is India's first liberal arts institution. Um, I lead the mobility vertical of a project called Encouraging Low Carbon Lifestyles, which is supported by the MacArthur Foundation, where I've led four research studies on the behavioral barriers to the uptake of low carbon mobility modes, like public transportation, cycling, walking, and we've even looked at the purchase of electric vehicles. So that's currently what I do. Um, my work with the Urban Living Lab is in currently in four different cities, but my work with Ashoka University has been focused um, primarily in some of India's largest cities where the research was being conducted, places like Delhi and Bangalore and Mumbai. Um, and so, yeah, I graduated in 2014. Um, I knew I wanted to come back to India. I grew up a little bit in the US and also spent a lot of my school life in India. Um, and I missed it very much. So I wanted to come back and I knew I was interested in working on cities. I didn't specifically know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so when I came back, you know, I just started cold, you know, sending out cold emails, writing to people who wrote about cities, journalists, researchers, consultants, whoever I could find on the internet who was working in, on, in cities, about cities, doing research on cities. Um, it was a little bit challenging. I think at that point in time, very few people in India understood what a liberal arts degree was. Um, but I got lucky that one of the journalists I contacted actually went to a liberal arts degree and she reached out um, and she told me about a studio in Mumbai that was being set up by the, that was actually already set up by Columbia University's graduate School of Architecture and Planning and Preservation. Um, and they were looking, they were basically, it was a lab to study, you know, how do you communicate the challenges of rapid urbanization, right? To people who are not aware, who are not geographers, who are not urban planners, um, who are just, you know, regular people living in the city. How do you communicate these challenges and bring them to the forefront of knowledge? Um, I got very lucky that by the time she was telling me about it, she also told me they are hiring. Um, and I ended up working there for about a year and a half. It was a really unique experience because I got to conduct research on urban challenges like informality, homelessness, um, climate change. And I got to communicate my research to people who were not technical experts through stories and through art, right? And that was a really unique way to communicate um, and to share these challenges, to raise awareness and make sure people really understood what was happening in their city and not get caught, getting caught up in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, but it reached a point where I realized that in India, at least, there's only so much you can do with a bachelor's degree. In India, a lot of the jobs that I was looking at were wanted master's degrees or PhDs, um, which is challenging, right? So I was like, I'm going to go back and do a master's. So I ended up getting a master's in city and regional planning at Penn Design, the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I ended up specializing in community development. 
Um, but while I was there, I ended up taking a ton of courses on environmental planning. Um, and it really, really, you know, drove my interest in working in climate change and working in cities in South Asia. I ended up doing a summer research study in Dhaka in Bangladesh with the International Center for Climate Change and Development because I really wanted some experience working in climate change in the region, in cities, in this part of the world. I always wanted to come back here. Um, and so, yeah, it was a two-year program. I finished, and then upon graduation, I was looking for jobs. Um, it was the last semester of my degree, and I think we had a guest lecturer who was talking about um, the Netherlands and a lot of the flood resilience work that's being done there. Um, but he worked, I don't know if you all know Hank Goldbank, but you know, there's a lot of flood resilience work that's being done. And he worked in a global team, the person who was giving the guest lecture. And so he came back and I happened to be in a class with him and I was like, hey, you know any global work that's being done in India, right? You talk about cities in Southeast Asia, you're talking about cities in like South America. So do you know anything about South Asia? And he said, you've picked a really tough place, but there's actually the 100 Resilient Cities Program, which was started by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, they're actually, they were starting their first national level project the most part they work with cities, but in India, they wanted to work with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, which I think is the equivalent of HUD in the US. Um, and so he connected me to the people at the Rockefeller team and I applied for the job in Delhi and I got it and it was great. And I moved back to Delhi and it was fascinating to start to think, to work at it within national government and really think, how do you come up with frameworks to get more than 4,000 urban local bodies to think about resilience. Um, India at that point had launched their smart cities mission. They were very interested in employing technology to think about urban challenges. And so a lot of my work was how do you connect technology and climate change and resilience? How do you think about data for flood resilience, for example, right? Um, it was fascinating, but I missed working in one city on one challenge, 4,000 cities is a lot. It's really hard to create policy for that many cities. Um, I remember there was an exercise we did and we, <laughs> it was about cycling. It was about non-motorized transport and trying to get people to adopt it. And a lot of cities in the mountainous region in the Himalayas were like, you've got to be kidding. We cannot be doing this. Like there are going to be accidents. There's no culture of this. You know, you can't force us to do this. And then I was like, I, I can't I can't be working at the scale where there's no there's not enough context. Right. So um I really wanted to work at a city level. So I can I moved to where I am now, right? Which is transitions research, the science research collective. Um and I have been working as part of their urban living lab team since twenty twenty. So towards I, I don't think the U.S. had the same kind of lockdown that India did. Um, India went to complete shutdown. But when we opened back up towards the end of 2020, I moved um, to Goa, started this role. Um, and my work with my other organization, the Center for Social and Behavior Change, kind of happened by fluke. Um, I actually, with Transitions Research, worked on a proposal for the MacArthur Foundation. Um, but we weren't eligible due to lots of complicated grant funding criteria. Um, so we actually just took it to the university as a partnership because they could accept money. So <laughs> that's how I ended up with Ashoka University. But it's been really interesting to work with them because I am not a behavioral scientist. I've never, never taken a psychology class. Um, and so to really think about, you know, my work has always been, how do you provide the infrastructure to get people to, to walk, to cycle, um, to take metro or of buses. Um, but now it's like, how do you encourage a normative and value-based shift to get people to move out of their private vehicle to actually take that? So it's been really fun. And I think I've been, yeah, I think that's a good overview. I can talk about anything in more detail if needed. Thank you. Yeah, that that's that's great. And uh, that's a good introduction. Uh, I didn't know you you had done all that as well and moved around. I, I missed that detail that you'd moved around so much. And done that. So um, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think maybe we'll just start with a few questions here. Uh, and uh, first question I have is, uh, what skills, knowledge, or dispositions you learned as a geography major um, 
have translated effectively in your career, you know, everything from maybe analytical skills, critical thinking, problem solving, et cetera. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Sure. Um, I think the first and maybe the easiest skill to talk about is probably GIS. I think geospatial technologies have definitely advanced since I was at MID. They've changed a lot. Um, but I think it's been a really important skill for every job I've had in every interview I've been in, me being able to highlight that I understand GIS, I understand concepts, right? I'm able to learn a new platform if you want to use a specific tool, but I understand the concepts and I think that's really important. Um, I think when I was at Middlebury, it was the first year Jeff started these YouTube playlists um, and GIS at mid. Um, and I, I, I love the way that he taught the concepts with the interface. And you have these videos that explain what a raster is and what vector is, and then you'd actually have the work and the problem solving. And I think it's been really helpful. I can give you a quick example. I mean, in one of the cities where our lab operates, right? Um, their, their local board boundaries change quite a bit. So I think that's similar to like a census tract for y'all, right? Um, the census data is actually from 2011, and the boundaries have changed at least two or three times. And since I've been at the organization, the word boundaries have changed twice. So if I need to do any kind of analysis, I actually end up going back to those videos. Even though Jeff has made many more, whoever teaches GIS now has made many more videos, I still go back and I actually click the oldest button on YouTube. Um, and especially that video that he made on area-weighted reaggregation, right? That's something that I watch all the time. Every time I have to do this work, I go back and I watch it. Um, and it's, I think GIS is a really critical skill if you want to do any kind of urban planning work um, because you need to be able to understand your city. You need to be able to think about challenges in a spatial way, not just a temporal way, which at least here tends to be the dominant framing of things. So um, GIS has been a really, really great skill. Um, the other thing that I think has come up, of course, critical thinking and problem solving and all of that, but one that I think is really important is also communication skills. Um, I remember geography being I mean, in my opinion, it seemed it was a very rigorous major. Um, I remember having a lot of papers and essays as compared to exams, which means I feel like I had to do a lot of writing. And I think that, you know, even in the world of generative AI, like that, that can't be taken away from me, right? The fact that I spent a lot of time writing and thinking through how to formulate arguments and present um, what I'm trying to say. And at work, that's translated me being effective at delivering presentations, project reports, but also articles for the media, right? I think no matter what you do, no matter what field you go into, no matter what career, work is not only technical, it's also about communicating your insight to the general public. Um, and I think that that's been really important. And I also think communication in terms of cartography was great because geography also has a cartography class. Um, I don't know if that's evolved now, but I think it's a tool to really help me. I've been able to make maps for government officials. I've been able to, you know, make presentations. I've actually even done public art exhibits where I've created maps and elicited insights from the public to understand their opinions about different urban challenges in their neighborhoods and their communities. And so I think communication is something that geography taught me, and it's more than just you know, saying what you feel, but it's really about communicating for different audiences, presenting arguments well, and being able to deliver different types of written and graphical outputs. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. It's great to see you used to go back to those videos. But, oh, yeah. and, and, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the technology keeps changing on us, but the concepts are the same. Mm -hmm. So that's really the important thing. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, let me ask you, um, how has your how has your major in geography influenced your life after graduation and who you have become in ways other than professional? Yeah. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I definitely think that it, I think geography is a major, the program at Middlebury helped kind of shape the way I look and understand, look at and understand the world. Um, living in India, I mean, development challenges are obviously obvious, obviously obvious, they're very prominent, right? You'll walk down the street and you'll definitely understand that. Um, and there's very much a level of spatiality, which is not always obvious to people I talk to, right? So I've 
been living in India, I've been working in cities for a long time. And obviously the majority of people who live in cities are not geographers. They're not people who are thinking spatially. You know, they're people who are living their day-to-day lives. Um, but it's really important to be able to have conversations about where you live, right? With people, it informs policy, it informs lots of things, right? Um, and the spatiality within which the world works and the way politics work and everything is something that I think has informed my day-to-day relationships with people around me. Um, and I think one example is when I was in Mumbai, you know, um, there's the housing redevelopment program where people who are living in informal settlements are offered the opportunity to move into decent housing for sure with electricity and services, but they're resettled really far away. Right? Um, there's very dominant discourse that, you know, now these people have homes, why aren't they moving? Why can't they go? Um, but I think even with my friends, I find that and it's really, it used to be really troubling to me. And the more I thought about it, I was like, I think people don't understand what a place is in geography. You learn about space versus place, right? Um, and there's a nuance of when people live in a community, they access livelihood, they, you know, they have networks, social networks that have been formed. Um, I worked with homeless communities who told me, you know, if I'm getting late from work, the local shopkeeper could watch my child. I'm not worried about it, right? When you resettle people really far away, nobody's thinking about that. How do you actually ensure all these social networks and other kind of benefits that are place-based, right, um, are really part of the stories and part of policy. And I think, you know, these are just in conversations with my friends, right? So it's definitely shaped how I view the world, how I think about place, conversations I have with people. Um, but the other thing is, you know, it's actually also informed my hobbies. When I travel, I always make little maps of where I go. Um, and it's just a fun, like, I, I don't put it up anywhere. I just I actually have like a binder back in my bookshelf and I have some of the maps and they're not like great. Sometimes I hand draw them. Um, I'm not the best at cartography. I could do it, but it's just, fun for me. And I've actually been doing um, some volunteer work um, with an organization. Um, my, I'm now hybrid also, but I spent part of my time in a small city called Ranchi, which is in the eastern part of India. It's closest to the biggest city that maybe people would have heard of as Calcutta. Um, and there are a lot of forest fires that take place in a village that's pretty close by to the city because um, the way that they harvest the certain flowers, they burn, communities will burn the ground to be able to harvest the flower. Um, and I'm actually working with some people there to actually try and use remote sensing techniques and map it out and understand the extent of the fire. And that's just something I'm doing in my free time, right? So um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, geography's great. <laughs> that's kind of all I have to say. <laughs> That's great that you have uh, all those maps and a binder there. We're going to have to, we might have to to wrench them out of you at some point and have you show us some of those or you should, you should put some up. They, I bet you uh, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. That's a, that's a great, great hobby. Uh, well, uh, let's see. Um, let me ask you like me one, one more question here Sorry. and what advice do you have for other students of geography as they think about and prepare for their future? Yeah, um, I think there are a couple of things. Take advantage of your professors. I think that's the first one. Um, I know the geography department has changed. I actually, Bill, when you emailed me, I was like, let me go check out the geography department. And it's larger now than it was when I was there. But I think in general, geography professors are great. I used to have really small class sizes. All the professors had office hours and were willing to accommodate us at all times. And I think when you're at college, you're so caught up with so many things that are happening, not always just classwork, but also your social life and any clubs and activities and jobs that you have or all of that. But take advantage of your professors, the knowledge they have, the time they're willing to share with you. Um, I, I, I I wish I had done so much more of that, right? And I think I, I, I have such fond memories from all of my classes. Um, and I find myself thinking about a lot of concepts in life today. And I sometimes wish, oh, like I wish, I don't know, I wish I could like go back and have these conversations, right? And that's much harder when you leave while you're there, you know, take advantage of having that network of close professors, small class sizes. Um, and the other thing about geography that I think as a community, like the Geography Alumni Network, we're, 
I feel like a strong community. Um, I always see, I mean, I feel like very few people use Facebook nowadays. I feel like people, especially younger than me, don't really use Facebook, but like the Middle Road Geography Facebook group is active. Like everyone posts jobs on it. And I, I love that. I love also seeing what people are up to. And I mean, the, the, the alumni, the geography alumni, I feel are very helpful. When I was at college, they were very helpful. They helped me get internships all the time. They were happy to like connect me with other people. LinkedIn is far more robust now than, than it was earlier. So you could easily find out if some somebody knows somebody who could help you have a conversation. So take advantage of the alumni network. Take advantage of the professors. Geography people are great. That's kind of what I'm trying to say and make the most of it. Um, and the other thing is to do internships, right? Take the time, do internships, use JTERM and take cool classes. Just try out as much as you can. Because I think that, you know, this geography is, is it, it can be applied to a lot of things, right? And you can use it in so many different ways. So if you're interested in any one thing, for example, behavioral science, right? Like I'm only saying that because the work I'm doing now, find a way to make a geography link and do a cool JTERM project or, you know, take it and take, find, you know, find an internship, just find a way to practice what you're interested in. I think Middlebury makes that really easy and possible, so. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, yeah. just so you know, you mentioned internships and there's yes. um, the Center for Careers and Internships and mm -hmm. um, and then also the geography department have been working together really closely for years. But we have actually a, a lot more opportunities now in some ways than we did even when you were there. I mean, we had some sort of local ones, but now there just seems to be um, quite a bit out there. So and. Uh, it's great to see students taking advantage of that too. So, but, and then students doing independent studies and, and things like that are, are really, and so it's nice that we do as a department, I think have uh, a fair amount of resources to support that and interest, you know, by the faculty to do it. So yeah, it's still happening. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I'd like to um, maybe finish up here. I, I do have one. I, you mentioned one thing that sort of sparked my interest, and I, mm -hmm. I wondered if you would be willing to just speak to it for a moment. Um, you, you mentioned about behavioral science yes. and geography and the sort of the intersection of those or the understanding of both of those and then the intersection of them and how that affects your work. And I wondered if you could just speak to that just a little bit more, mm -hmm. those two, two um uh, sciences, I guess, <laughs> are, yeah. are fields of, and and how they have speak to those a little bit, and then how they have uh, changed the way that you work. Mm -hmm. I think sure. I'll do my best to answer that question because it's also a hard one. Um, I think that so as a and I think it's less my geography degree, but it was going and doing an urban planning degree after, where I I think that as an urban planner you're taught kind of, you need to provide these systems, they need to be in place. You obviously need to understand communities, but like infrastructure needs to be in place and services need to be provided and all of this needs to happen, right? Um, and a lot of that is place-based, right? You have to think about like the landscapes you're in, you need to think about the culture that you're in, a lot of that's also place-based. So geography and urban planning to me, at least they're very well linked and connected. Um, and I definitely had this perspective that planning and thinking about cities was very much spatial. And when you provide the right kind of infrastructure and the right policies and the right services, you know, people would be able to have, you know, people would have decent livelihoods, people would be able to have decent housing, you know, people would not be suffering from the same kind of waterborne health diseases when you provide access to clean water supply and decent sewerage. Um, and I think that that perspective changed a little bit when I started working with Ashoka University and my work with behavior science. Like I said, I've never taken a psychology class. I really didn't like bio, bio biology, any of that stuff. I mean, like, that's an area I definitely get away from. Um, and so this project kind of brought it into my foray. And it was fascinating because it made me realize that there, there's a demand side and a supply side. And they're very much interlinked. The supply side is very spatial, place-based. What are the services? What are the infrastructure you need to provide? For example, you know, we're doing work on how do you get people in Delhi to take the metro system, 
right? Now the metro system in Delhi is India's largest. It's actually one of the largest in the world. Um, when I lived in Delhi, I took it all the time. It's very convenient, um, good quality, clean, you know, all of that. And I was like, great, why is everyone not taking this? Like, why does Delhi still have massive per capita car ownership? And then you realize that it's not only about providing the services in the places they need to be. It also is about changing people's mindsets. And so in order to think about, you know, one of the things we say at work is climate change is cultural, right? Um, and so how do you actually get people to change their mindset, get rid of what we call car pride, right? Um, there's a lot of status associated, especially in this part of the world, with owning a car, owning a certain type of car, um, you know? And how do you inculcate that normative shift? And it's, it's a value-based shift, right? Um, and you can't do one without the other, which is what I think is really interesting, right? So in Goa, where our work is, where our lab is, there's no public transportation, right? You can't start doing work to try and inculcate a value or normative-based shift if there's no public transport. You need to provide the place-based services. That's where geography comes in. But then our work in Delhi taught me, you also need to think about what people want and how they frame things and how they understand the world. We had part of our survey and our research, we asked someone who literally, when they get down from their apartment building, have to walk the equivalent of one block and they're at the metro station. And when they get out of the metro, their office building is in front of them, right? And it, it's direct, they don't even have to change lines. And he was like, but person who works junior to me, right? Like a junior colleague has a private car. So how can I take the metro and come to work, right? That's a change that has to be made through behavioral societal shift, not a place-based shift necessarily. So the work, I think when we're thinking about how we want to affect our future, right? How we want, for me, it's how we want our cities to be. How do we want our lives to be, the quality of our lives? It's both about the very much place-based services, infrastructure, what's needed, but it's also about a behavioral change. And it's not just that person. I mean, when I moved to Goa, there was no trash. There was no, there was no I guess in the US, you don't have this video. It's like there's wet waste and dry waste, and wet waste is like food waste or organic waste. Um, and all the cities I lived in in the past, which were Bombay, Delhi, all of that, they like would collect your waste segregated. When I moved to Goa, I lived in a really small village. It was like smaller than Middlebury. Um, and they didn't collect the organic waste. And so my landlord was like, you can just burn it. And I was like, I could just burn it. I'm not burning my waste. And I taught myself how to compost my waste. Um, and that's because I had the intent and the motivation to do so. There are lots of people around me who continue to burn their waste, right? Um, and it's about everything from what you drive to what you eat to, you know, how you manage your waste, all sorts of things, right? Um, and I think you need both. You need both the place-based changes and the behavioral shifts. That answer the question. I feel like I want to start repeating myself otherwise. That was that was great. Thank you. I okay, cool. really uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that um, that probably uh, uh, concludes uh, the time that we have. And uh, uh, so, thank you so much for speaking with us yeah. and, uh, and taking the time and. Uh, uh, well, uh, good luck with all your work. Thank and, you very uh, much, Bill. And yeah. I just, any alumni, any students who watch this, like I'm always happy to chat. Um, so anyone can reach out to me. I'm on the mid to mid platform, but I'm also on LinkedIn. I also have email. So that's, like, that's good. I'm whatever. glad you mentioned that. Yeah, the mid to mid platform is great. It's a great yeah. way to communicate with uh, with alumni. So, and I know students are aware of it, but we'll, we'll uh, mention it again <laughs> for them. Good, so. cool. Good. Well, I'm going to stop this recording now. And, okay. uh, thanks. Thanks.